gather here today on your holy Sabbath to again study the events of one of the prophecies from your word and, and that role of that movement of that prophecy in the world, both in the past and at the present. So Lord, just bless us with the wisdom, with the guidance of your spirit is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> okay, we are looking, as you know, at the role of Islam in prophecy. There's a lot of people that um, have a lot of weird ideas about this. I was listening to somebody just not long ago talking about how uh, um, Christianity and Islam are brothers and that they all stem from the same faith. And uh, this person to be a Seventh-day Adventist that holds a doctorate, well, that might be why he has those weird things. He's got him a PhD in, I think it's languages, but for people to say that and try to put Islam and Christianity together cannot be. They never have been. Um, so what we're going to, to look at, we're going to pick it up where we left off last week. We had this in your workbook that you filled out as we look at the fifth trumpet, which was the rise of Islam, uh, how with Muhammad it came out of the uh, Arabian Peninsula like a swarm of locusts and spread out. And we looked at a few of the areas into which it spread. We also saw that this prophecy of the fifth and sixth trumpets did much to, to strengthen the faith of God's people concerning the cleansing of the sanctuary in 1844. So this prophecy in your workbook that we ended with played a major role in the great religious awakening of the last century for it established in a marvelous way the prophetic chronology of the Bible. And we're going to see that really specific prophecy today of 391 years and 15 days, a prophecy that gave us the exact day that it was to be filled or be fulfilled. So shortly after the death of Muhammad, his followers began to divide into various factions under several leaders and remained in this divided state until about the close of the 13th century. So when Muhammad died, they were kind of uh, just running around, if you remember, to torment, not to kill. They were only to torment for 150 years, okay? Now, something was to happen, though, when Ottoman now comes on the scene and Othman consolidated them into a great monarchy called the Ottoman Empire, which was a very large empire and existed for many, many years. So Othman brought all of these tribes together, united them in this gigantic empire that we will be looking at, and it said in the scriptures, and they had a king over them. Remember that. And so after consolidating all of the Mohammedans under one central government known as the Ottoman Empire, now they set their sights on the empire of Eastern Rome, which was centered where? Constantinople. So now they are going to break loose from Arabia, or from the Middle East, or the Near East, whatever terms that they want to put on it, and they're going to spread up into Europe in a, in a very rapid way. And so on July 27th, 1299, Othman began his invasion against the Christian world. Now coming up against the Christian world, and he's going to do this for 100 and... <laughs> 50 years, which we will see brings us to 1449. So this is what was taking place. So taking this as a starting point, the 150 year period would then end in 1449, the very year that the Byzantine Empire fell. 
The last emperor of Eastern Rome was Constantine Palaiologos, and he did not receive permission to ascend the throne until January 6, 1449. So the Turks had control, and uh, the Roman emperor was not permitted to, and did not even want to try and take the throne until he got permission of the Ottoman Turks because uh, he was to be subservient to the Ottoman Empire. And Constantinople has been that way ever since uh, 1449, okay? So the emperor was permitted to reign in Constantinople until April the 6th of 1453, okay? So he was able to stay there, but when he died, the last of the Constantines fell, and Constantinople, the eastern city of the Caesars, now became the seat of the Ottoman Empire. Okay, so this is what was happening at that period of time. This is just prior now to the beginning of the Reformation. Just prior to the beginning of the Reformation. Now, one good thing that did come out of this, can you think of what it might be? Pardon me? Not really. They still continue to do that. And there's something even greater. What pre preceded the Reformation? What was one of the things that helped open the door for the Reformation? Where's my history book? What? No, it's not a theological thing as such. It also starts with an R. There was an R that preceded the Reformation. Renaissance. Renaissance. The Renaissance. You see, when Rome went down in the east, there was not this control anymore, and all of the wisdom of the east and all of the manuscripts of the east and the art of the east and this new birthing, if you will, was what began to open the door which allowed a reformation to take place less than a hundred years later. So this was what was going on. It's in this time frame here. Now, in the prophecy uh, that it went from four, up to 1449. There was to be something else that was to happen. So let's take our Bibles now and let's go to Revelation. I want to read this sixth trumpet here right quick today. Revelation, the ninth chapter. And beginning with verse 12. Okay, when the first, uh, the fifth angel says, one woe is past, and behold, there come two woes more hereafter. Now here's the sixth angel. The sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, loose the four angels, which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared, now here's the time prophecy, for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay the third part of men. And the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000 thousand, and I heard the number of them. And thus I saw the horses in the vision and them that sat on them having breastplates of fire and of Jasoneth and brimstone and heads of horses, whereas the heads of lions and out of their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone. We'll look at some more of this in a few moments now. So God's time prophecy has to be fulfilled to the letter, okay? Now, this is what Josiah Litch said about this 391 years and 15 days. Commencing on July 27, 1299, the 150 years reach 1449. 
During that whole period, the Turks were engaged in an almost perpetual war with the Greek Empire, but yet without conquering it. Okay, From 1299 to 1499. They seized upon and held several of the Greek provinces, but still Greek independence was maintained at Constantinople. Now, when this 150 years ended, here we see, in 1449, a change came. And the Ottoman Empire was no longer restricted to tormenting men, but now they were able to slay. So when this trumpet sounds, they are now going to go in and begin to destroy, even into Europe, uh, the corrupt church. So God's time prophecy had been fulfilled to the very year. But now he gives this one that's going to be fulfilled to the very day. Can the Bible be so accurate as to foretell an event to the very hour, day, month, and year, nearly 1,800 years before it happens. Yes, yes it can. Skeptics say, no, that had to have been written after this because that could never happen. With God as its author, God is the one that knows the end from the beginning and the things not yet done. And people who do not understand that cannot grasp prophecy. So on July 27, 1299, the Islamic armies began their attack against the Byzantine Empire, bringing torment and darkness to the Christian world. But the prophet said that for that five months or that 150 years, they were not going to be, anything, be able to do anything but to torment. And then after that, they were to actually slay the people. So John hears this, uh, this other trumpet and he says that they are bound up in the great river Euphrates. Now where is the river Euphrates? <clears throat> Iraq, yeah. Yes. Well they wanted to conquer the world and we're going to see this and they're, they're almost accomplishing that today. I'm just wondering how the prophecy fulfilled on them what, what they were wanting and what they didn't want to do at the time. All they wanted to do was declare jihad and make the whole world Islamic. That was their goal. And in the process to kill anybody that would not convert. So Yes, they do. They firmly believe that. Yeah. And that, uh, that only, God can only be understood through, basically, um, the Quran and Muhammad. And so that's why everything centers on that. And we'll see some more of that as, as we move through here. So what we're going to see now is this hour, day, month, year. Uh, many scholars have talked about these, um, the four angels there. The four angels refer to the leading sultanies which comprised the Ottoman Empire. Aleppo, by the way, <laughs> this Aleppo, uh, if the Democrat, uh, not the Democratic, the Independent, John, John well, we're here today, he'd say, what's Aleppo? <laughs> Did you hear that? Yeah. Yeah. Gary Johnson. Yeah, yeah, Johnson, yeah. Third party candidate. Yeah. So, but Aleppo was one of the sultan, uh, sultanies over there, and it is uh, uh, the head of Syria. Damascus was another one. Remember, we've studied how when the Christians fled. They fled up to Damascus and over into Antioch, trying to get away. Now, as a matter of fact, even in Jerusalem, one of the gates is called the Damascus Gate, you see. The Iconium was another one, and the fourth one is the one that uh, everybody's heard of, Baghdad. 
That's where Aladdin came from. <laughs> so these were the four sultanies of the Ottoman Empire. The four angels or the four messengers that comprise that empire. Um, and they were restrained until 1449 when God commanded that they should be loosed and they came out of that area and went in, uh, into Europe. So from this point in time, the Ottoman Empire was to continue for an hour, a month, a day, a year. And uh, I want us to see just what that would be here. One day equals one what? One year. And one year equals 360 years, and one hour equals 1 24th of a year or 15 days. So we have a figure here of 391 years and 15 days. The 150 years of torment began July 27th, 1299. They ended July 27th, 1449. So, what we see now is adding 391 years and 15 days to July 27, 1449, we would arrive at August the 11th, 1840. So you see how this Methodist minister came up with this, uh, this statement in 1838, two years before it happened. Josiah Litch said it was going to happen. So I want us to see again what Josiah Litch said in 1838. But when will this power, the Ottoman Empire, be overthrown? According to the calculations already made that the five months ended in 1449, the hour, 15 days, the day, one year, the month, 30 years, and the year, 360 years, in all, 391 years and 15 days, will end in A.D. 1840, sometime in the month of August. So here we see that Josiah Litch, two years before it ever happened, said it's going to happen in August of 1840. He didn't know exactly when, but sometime in August is what he said. At the beginning, he didn't fix the date, but he changed it. Now watch what Ellen White says. Ellen White makes a tremendous reference to this in the Great Controversy. In the year 1840, another remarkable fulfillment of prophecy excited widespread interest. Two years before, that's in 1838, Josiah Litch, one of the leading ministers preaching the Second Advent, the 1844 message, published an exposition of Revelation 9 predicting the fall of the Ottoman Empire. According to his calculations, this power was to be overthrown in A.D. 40, she's quoting him, sometime in the month of August, and only a few days previous to its accomplishment, he wrote, allowing the first period, 150 years, to have been exactly fulfilled before Dickensies ascended the throne by permission of the Turks, and that the 391 years, 15 days, commenced at the close of the first period, it will end on what? August the 11th, 1840. Now he gives the exact day that the Ottoman Empire was to lose its power. She goes on and says, when the Ottoman power in Constantinople may be when the Ottoman power in Constantinople may be expected to be broken. That is August the 11th, 1840. And this, I believe, will be found to be the case. Did it happen? Yes. And it happened because he based it upon the word of God and the prophetic timetable. Exactly the day that it was to fall he put it in writing for the whole world to see. Now, when he did this, he got a lot of ridicule. You know, we had infidel clubs in, throughout the U.S. in those days. Uh, 
now we just have a bunch of infidels running loose everywhere. But they said, how dare a person try to make a prediction on a world power falling on a certain day and all of this. But he was, he was made the subject of ridicule until August 11, 1840. And then, yeah, they didn't. They quit talking. <laughs> Oops, yeah. Yeah. Sure it did. I mean, this fulfillment, I mean, it just gave more credibility to what they were preaching back then. The emphasis became so much greater because who would ever have thought that something like this would happen? And um, so, Litch's view on this prophecy were noted in many public journals of the day. They were watched with his intense interest by thousands of people. And many, like I said, severely ridiculed the man. But when the news of the collapse of this world power was flashed to an unbelieving world, it was startling that the word of God had been that clear. The exact fulfillment to the very day of this event showed beyond any doubt, any questions at all, that the word of God was infinitely reliable and that the day-year prophetic formula was absolutely accurate. So this enabled uh, the Bible students to more fully understand these prophecies of Daniel 8.14 and 7.25 and 12.7 and those in Revelation as well of the, the different things. We did a study in our Bible marking of the prophetic chronology in the Bible, marked all of those out. And so as a result of this, we see things began to happen in a great sort of a way. This drawing shows it clearly. August the 11th, 1840. The seven angels, the fifth and the sixth, have now sounded. There's only one angel left to sound. Only one left. But before we go to that one, at the very time specified, that this is great controversy again, Turkey, through her ambassadors, accepted the protection of the allied powers of Europe and thus placed herself under the control of Christian nations. The event exactly fulfilled the prediction. So the remnant prophet again verifies these facts. And then when it became known, multitudes were convinced of the correctness of the principles of prophetic interpretation adopted by Miller and his associates, and a wonderful impetus was given to the Advent movement. Men of learning and position united with Miller both in preaching and in publishing his views. And from 1840 to 1844, the work rapidly extended. Josiah Lidge? Pardon me? He died. He died before. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can consider him an Adventist. This is the Advent movement. Yeah. He was, he was an Adventist in that sense. Um, remember, the earlier, William Miller was a Baptist preacher. He was an Adventist. But he just never came to see the Sabbath. And so there were several like that of these men who died before uh, we even learned about the Sabbath. Remember, we didn't hear about the Sabbath until it was brought to us through uh, Rachel Oaks and Joseph Bates went and got that. And when you read the story, when we get into the history of our church here and look at how God gave people like Bates and others visions dreams said get on a train and go and they'd get on a train and just ride until a train pulled in a town that they saw in their dream and they'd get off of the train and they'd go to work in that town Bates went to Berrien Springs now Berrien Springs was not a Seventh Day Adventist community yet and he goes in there and what does Bates do he goes to the post office and he asked the postmaster, 
Who is the most honest man in town? <laughs> and I forget the man's name now. And the postmaster told him, well, that would be so-and-so. So Bates goes to his house, knocks on his door. It's early in the morning. Man comes to the door, and <laughs> Bates says, yes, sir, I hear that you're the most honest man in Bering Springs. And he says, if that be true, I have a message for you. And the man invited, he was eating breakfast. The man invited him in. Remember, they ate breakfast real early in those days, too. And he went in, and he shared a study on the Sabbath, and that man became a Seventh-day Adventist. And that's how the word began to go. When you read some of these stories, it's just amazing. <clears throat> and so, for... 391 years and 15 days, the Ottoman Empire, the Ottoman Turks, plagued the Christian church. Let's go back to Revelation again. I want to read verses, a couple more verses here. Where can you read some of the stories? Uh, Spirit of Prophecy Treasure Chest Treasure is Chest. one of the best places if you still got it. And that's what we're, I'm planning on doing some studies on that in the very near future. Good. Um. And also you can find some of it in the biography, the, the four volumes from 1827 to 1915, 1827-1915, there's some of them in there. There's a lot of places you can find them. But going back here to Revelation chapter 9, uh, we ended with, let's pick it up with 17. I want to read verse 17 with this here, 17 on down to 19. And thus when, thus when I saw the horses in the vision and them that sat on them having breastplates of fire and jaceneth and brimstone, the heads of the horses were as the heads of lions, out of their mouth issued fire and smoke and brimstone. By these three was a third part of men killed by the fire and the smoke and the brimstone, which issued out of their mouths. For their power was in their mouth and in their tails, for their tails were like unto serpents and had heads, and with them they do hurt. Okay. So for 391 days, 15 days, the Turks plagued the Christian church. But these fierce warriors now, as they're coming across into Europe, arrayed in their uniforms of red and blue and yellow. Now, by the way, fire is red. Jathmuth is blue, and brimstone is yellow. And what is being portrayed here is something new being introduced into warfare. What would that be? Gunpowder. Gunpowder Gun and firearms. These warriors, as the previous ones had done riding their horses and shooting arrows like the American Indians, these would go on horseback and as they'd fire from the front or even fire from the back of their horses. Remember, the early guns had a flash. Fire would come out. You know why they really wanted to suppress those flash things? In our day even, well, just a little before some of your days, but most guns had a flash. You could see it. You could see where you were and they see a flash, they shoot there. Besides the flash, there was another real problem with gunpowder. Smoke. Shoot it where the smoke is, and even if you don't see somebody, there's somebody by that smoke. Also, when you just wet, you don't shoot. Well, yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> that's, that's for sure. Okay. So, the founder of the cannon uh, deserted the Turkish, Turkish Sultan Muhammad, and he was... Um, or he deserted to the Turkish Sultan, okay? And immediately, uh, Mohammed asked him, can you cast me a cannon of size sufficient to batter down the walls of Constantinople? And history reveals that the answer was a definite yes. Because the Turks came in and they put these cannons up all along the hills around there. And they sat up there and they just kept bombarding it, firing the cannons 
into the walls of this place. I want you to see something here. Watch what history tells us about this. The volleys of lances and arrows were accompanied with the smoke, the sound, and the fire of the musketry and the cannon. The long order of Turkish artillery was pointed against the walls. Fourteen batteries thundering at once on the most accessible places. The fortifications, which had stood for ages against hostile violence, were dismantled on all sides by the Ottoman cannon. Many breaches opened, and near the gate of St. Romus, four towers leveled with the ground. As from the lines, the galleys, and the bridge, the Ottoman artillery thundered at all sides. The camp in the city, the Greeks and the Turks were involved in a cloud of smoke which could only be dispelled by the final deliverance or destruction of the Roman Empire. This is what was taking place with that cannon. It introduced an awesome weapon into warfare now. And uh, as the smoke cleared, it revealed to a startled world that Constantinople was irretrievably subdued her empire now was subverted and her religion trampled in the dust by the Muslim conquerors. And in light of this historical account, is it any wonder that the prophet John said, by these were a third part of men killed by the fire and by the smoke and by the brimstone. Four sultans now came on the scene. These are very important to understand, these guys here. These are the major ones from the 1500s. Now we're coming into the time of the Reformation. Okay? And first one is Mohammed, Mohammed Mehep, and he was the conqueror when Constantinople actually fell. Okay? And he ruled the Ottoman Empire, or the next one. This, these are kind of difficult for me to read on the screen here. Back up a little bit. Uh, from 1451 to 1481, he ruled the Ottoman Empire as the 391 years began. Suleiman the Magnificent, this is the one that many people hear about in school, and he was from 1520 to 1566. He is the one that opposed Charles V and had Charles so fearful that the infidel Turks were going to come into the Roman Empire. And then Mohammed II from 1808 to 1839. And then this last one here from 1839 when it actually fell to the powers of Europe. But he continued to be there until 1861. So those are the four key sultans at that time. So this one, watch this closely because it's, it's, it has a lot, but it's going to be hard for you to see some of it. But this is the growth of the Ottoman Empire in the 1500s, okay? And so this, these things are kind of your chart here, but here's where it began in the Arabian Peninsula. And you can see here, and by 1512, anywhere you see these little swords crossed, and there's a lot of them all over the place bunch of them up here in, in Europe. These cross swords are dealing with a particular battle. So it came up out of here, and uh, then the, the lighter one is from 1512 to 1520, and then it goes up a little further to 1520 to 1566, and then when you get beyond 1566 to 1639 in the Ottoman Empire, then you have two other things in here. Here's the Holy Roman Empire, or what was the Austrian Habsburg possessions, okay? Um, and then you find also the Venetian Republic and some of its possessions. There's a little light blue up in some of these places here. But this can pretty well show you what was being controlled at that point in time, you see. Spain now is back as its own country again. They've lost Spain, but Spain even annexed a few of these little islands around here. So that is what it looked like in the 1500s.
quite widespread. It is greater than that today by a long shot. Uh, it does go, you know, when I was in uh, Romania, uh, Hungary, uh, Transylvania, um, some of these other places over there, you can see today the marks of Islam when they came up in through there. A lot of Islamic uh, uh, things are up there. Moss are there, uh, the old uh, uh, battlegrounds and so forth. But if you notice, what I want you to see, Islam, how did Christianity spread? Through preaching the gospel. How many times do we have a record where the Apostle Paul says, you either accept Jesus or we're going to kill you where you stand? None of them. But Islam, this in itself is the evidence, besides what we see today, spreads through war and oppression. That's what those battle things are really all about there. Huh? They don't really deny it because that's what jihad is. They are, they are commissioned by Allah to kill anybody that won't accept him or Muhammad as his messenger. Talk about religion yeah. See, this is what is so frustrating when you listen to these. I've got to be careful of the words I use. Doom coughs. <laughs> I can go to another language. Those dumb heads that are trying to say this. It, it never has been. There are some peaceful Muslims, so I'm not attacking Muslims on this, but I'm, I, I'm addressing the issue that people are putting propaganda out there and, and people are believing it, and, and, and it's a horrible thing. So, they can increase through wars and oppressions. Now, something happened in 1798. Those of you that have done the Daniel 11 study of the kings of the north and the south. The Pope was captured at that time. Well, in 1798, the Pope was captured by whom? Napoleon. 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 Okay, he sent his general, Berthier. What month did I? We'll do that in a little bit if you ask me afterwards. But something else was going on in 1798 with the kings of the north and south. Who was the king of the south in 1798? In 1798, Napoleon was the king of the south. He conquered Egypt and shocked the Muslim world. This is all in that book I wrote on the kings of the north and south, which I think are in the rack out there. We missed the one a couple of four. You're missing a couple of what? The seven Okay, leave that there because I was going to close with that, but I want to do this before I close. Okay, and so in 1798, Napoleon controlled Egypt, which was the south. And then you, might, you may remember the battles where he was pushing up against the Turks and they met at the Bay of Haifa up at uh, Mount Carmel, basically. And there they came against him and drove him back down into Egypt. And he still maintained his power in Egypt until he was recalled to, um, to France. Well, actually, he, got, he was getting recalled to go to something waiting for him in a place called Brussels, Belgium, just outside of Brussels. A place called Waterloo was, was blue, brewing for him, and he had to leave and go back, and he left uh, some folk there. That's all in the book. But he was the king. He was controlling the Ottoman Empire is getting weakened here. Can you see this? And then, during the last half of the 1800s and the early 1900s, Europe, and notice this, either directly or indirectly controlled every Muslim country except for Arabia, Turkey, and Iran. That's why the the Ottoman Empire became known as the sick man of the East. He had no power anymore except as it was granted him by the Eastern, um, by the European powers. Okay. 
Now this is, uh, I want to read this last two verses here, and then we'll look at what um, Brett was saying. Back to Revelation 9, verses 20 and 21. And the rest of them, rest of the men which were not killed by these what? Okay, so we see that these attacks of the fifth and sixth trumpets are plagues from God against a corrupt church. Watch this. Yet they repented not of their hands that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk. Neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. God plagued the corrupt church with Islam in order to bring the church to repentance, and she would not repent. She continued to murder those that opposed her uh, fornication, her, her false doctrines and stuff. So God's people had apostatized and withdrawn themselves from his protection. And he permitted this persecution to come upon them that he might turn them to himself, that they would worship him in spirit and in truth, but they repented not of these things. So the last two here that we're going to close with here today. The seventh trumpet is not introduced until Revelation eleven fifteen. So these plagues of locusts were permitted to plague, to turn her from her errors. What about us today? You know, God is constantly calling out to us to turn to him. Turn ye, turn ye, for why will ye die? You know, that's the words that Jesus used with Israel even, you see. But here, as this chapter closes, it closes with the sad reality that the church did not repent, continued on and continued for centuries to, to kill God's people, to worship idols, to commit fornication, to be involved in devil worship. Remember Revelation 13 says that whosoever worships the beast worships the dragon who gives a power. And then we find that the prophecies of chapters 10 and 11 are inserted now parenthetically between the sixth and the seventh trumpet. And we'll pick that up here next week at, uh, at the seventh trumpet. And then we're going to take a look at Islam today. Here's something very important to recall, too, or to remember. People out there are saying that the papacy started Islam. If they did then why did Islam persecute the papacy from its very beginning? Islam was not started by the papacy. Islam was started by whom? Huh? I don't believe that either. Well, who? Nope, don't believe that either. I believe, now hold on to this one, don't tie me in with some of our apostate preachers we have. Islam was started by God. He raised up Islam to plague the corrupt, rebellious church. Now, does God always use somebody that believes totally in him to do what he needs to have done? Be Cyrus was one, he, and it does it not say he sets up and takes down kingdoms. Napoleon. Napoleon. Uh, so we, we find this. Uh, Babylon. Pardon me. Babylon. Babylon. Right. Nebuchadnezzar. Right. So the Bible says he raises up and takes down kingdoms. Is is this a kingdom? You better believe it is. I believe, and we'll look at this a little better later. That when God called Muhammad, Muhammad was probably a true prophet just as Balaam was. But he went the way that Balaam did. And he 
corrupted himself. And the writings in the early part of the Quran and the latter part don't jive. He began to change things as he became more powerful. Study that out. We'll pick it up here the next time we come together. Okay, let's pray together. Father, we do thank you so much for the privilege we've had of coming together here. And dear Lord, I pray now that as we conclude our study and prepare for the following service, that your spirit would continue to be with us and keep us acutely aware of your presence here with us, dear Father, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.